Berkshire Hathaway, chairman and CEO Warren Buffett, joining us uh, just after writing his annual letter to shareholders. And uh, Warren, this is a big deal. It's something that the investment community uh, kind of waits on and, and sees as a must read because you spend so much time actually writing this I do. yourself. Yeah, too much. <laughs> when do you start writing the letter? Well, this one I, I started very early, or, uh, very early because I had one section in mind. It turned out to be the last section. But when I, when I, when I talk about the American tailwind, I, yeah. I, I probably wrote that in uh, late summer. And, and then I work around different sections, but it, it, it takes a long time. Yeah, I am not a first draft writer. <laughs> <laughs> well, for people who have been reading this for a long time, this letter was markedly different than you've written for the past three decades or so, because at the top, the opening of every letter uh, in the past to this point has been uh, Berkshire's percentage change in book value right. as the measure that you thought was most <clears throat> important. This time, you kind of stripped it out and said it's not the most important metric anymore for a couple of reasons, one is which Berkshire has changed so markedly, but also, uh, you just think it's it's not going to be the way that you'll be measuring things in the future. No, it's 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 not the more relevant uh, figure, at least over time, not in any one year period, but, but basically is market value because we have become uh, overwhelmingly an operating company, and we hope to become even more so than uh, a company that uh, really held a lot of stocks and bonds. Uh, so. Uh, I've, I've actually talked about that in previous reports. Uh, I wouldn't have wanted to quit in a year where I got clobbered by the one I was dropping <laughs> and, and was adopting one that made me look good. So, uh, so I actually included them both in, and it was a good year to, to make the transition. But, uh, and, and you said it's different. It, uh, I've always had the image that I am talking to my sisters. I have two sisters. They're both Berkshire's pretty much their whole investment. They're smart. They're not active in business, so uh, they're not reading about it every day. But I pretend they've been away for a year, and I'm reporting to them on their investment. And then this year, because we may be repurchasing shares, I, I tried to have the vision that they were talking to me about whether they should sell their shares, and I was explaining to them exactly how I would look at it if I were in their shoes. So, so it's Dear Doris and Bertie at the start, and then I take that off at the end. But I'm talking to them, and I'm trying to talk to them in a manner where if you know, they're practically entirely in Berkshire, and if they were thinking of selling some, here's what I'd want them to know before, uh, before they made a decision. To do that, you used a, a, a new uh, description for, mm -hmm. for coming up with it this time, which was the idea of having five groves, you being maybe a timber company and having five groves that Berkshire's really invested in. You broke down and, and looked at each of them on a case-by-case -case basis, one being the, the non-insurance businesses that Berkshire owns, another being the equities bunch that you right. have, uh, the final ones, the insurance companies, but you also have treasuries and cash that yeah. you're holding. And what am I? Oh, and, and then businesses that you own part of, not right. all of, would be the five own. groves. Um, that's pretty interesting. How'd you come up with the idea of just the groves? Because it is something that uh, somebody who's not so steeped in business can get their head around pretty easily. Yeah. Well, Berkshire, you know, has dozens and dozens and dozens of companies, and and when analysts look at it, you know, they want to go out and figure out, you know, how many boxes of Valentines we sold, you know, at our candy company, and, and you can get totally lost in terms of looking at the forest by trying to look at every tree, because some of the trees are flourishing, some of them are decaying, and some of them are huge and important, and others are, are more or less twigs. So I thought I would group the assets in a way that was logical and where you could sort of figure out uh, the valuation that you might attribute to that particular grove. And, and uh, uh, I think it's a lot better than trying to describe uh, 80 or 90 businesses with 300 and but close to 390,000 employees. I mean, we're in one of the businesses right now, and this is a very interesting business. But we've got Jordans in Boston, we've got Star in Houston, <laughs> we have RC Willie, and to go through everyone and tell them about the latest store we opened, and uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's much better just to look at them in groups because they make sensible groups.
Uh, to that point, this is the Ask Warren Show, and we have gotten a lot of questions that have come from viewers, some from Berkshire shareholders, others from people who are just longtime watchers. I'd like to bring up a question that comes from Marcelo P. Lima, or Lima. He, he writes in, and I think this comes from Twitter, Mr. Buffett, in your letter, you note that some of Berkshire's trees are diseased and unlikely to be around in a decade. Which ones do you have in mind, and how do we prevent healthy trees from joining them? Yeah, well, uh, I did say that, and but I, I would not name the ones that have major problems just from a morale standpoint with the people. We're going to keep running them, and, uh, but they, we have companies that are on, on the downswing as well as on the upswing, and uh, uh, it would be, it just, it would be very tough. And, and the, the ones that are, as I call it, diseased, they're a very, very, very small part of our earnings. Uh, You'd, you'd gain nothing analytically, and you'd have 100 people go to work today feeling, you know, well, we might as well give up or something of the sort. So I, I, I don't like to name them specifically, although you could probably figure some out by uh, looking at our list of companies. Uh, there's, some companies are just in the wrong industry. I mean, if you, know, if you, if you, if you made, uh, you know, whatever it may, uh, well, even making televisions in this country. I mean, that was a hot industry, you know, when I was young. and, and uh, we don't do it anymore. Uh, we sell a lot of them here at our <laughs> store, but uh, uh, so I, I, I would not, I would not like it if I were working at Company X and and uh, my boss had just got through saying, you know, <laughs> you're in decay. <laughs> <laughs> you do name some of the big redwoods that that you consider to be essential to the grove, though. Yeah. I, I think you said that uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy. And the railroad, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, are two of the biggest redwoods that stand in the ground. Well, they're big. Yeah, uh, they're big, and and both set records for after-tax earnings last year. Combined, they earn uh, right around eight billion dollars after tax, and eight billion is a lot of money to us. That's that's a third of our operating earnings. Uh, we earned twenty-four, uh, a large fraction uh, of operating earnings last year, twenty-four billion. Uh, uh, and and those two companies alone earned eight. Now Berkshire Hathaway Energy also has multiple companies, but mm -hmm. the BNSF Railroad is just one big railroad. Uh, let, let's talk about that operating profit number. It was twenty-four point eight billion dollars, but on a gap basis, which you're now focusing on, it was four billion dollars, and that comes because of an accounting change that came into play this time around. It was a twenty point six billion dollar paper lost on your investment holdings that you now count back in from the huge amount of securities that you own and then also the $3 billion write down on craft. Yeah. Uh, you go out of your way to emphasize again that you don't think people should be looking at these gap earnings even though you're reporting them that way. Yeah, and we say the same. Well, that's the final gap earnings. The 24.8 billion also are gap earnings, but they're operating earnings. Right. Uh, and uh, I think they were, we had some outside tailwind on that, but, but they were 41% greater than any year we've ever had on operating uh, earnings. But uh, beyond that, we have this large portfolio of stocks and also the write down in Kraft Heinz. But the main thing was the portfolio of stocks. And uh, we've made a lot of money over in stocks over time, but there's been years uh, when we've lost money too. And I, I, I tell the shareholders that, uh, that we expect, we expect to make money on stocks over time. We haven't got the faintest idea what years will, will be up or down. And then, they changed the rule last year so that unrealized uh, gains or losses are recognized through gap income. That had not been true uh, for dozens and dozens and dozens of years before. So that, uh, that changed our figures. But I, 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 that's what I explained. That's why I tell Doris and Bertie <laughs> what's happened in the counting during the year as well as the business. But you should point out this time it was a decline of more than $20 billion. There will be quarters where you'll see a huge upswing, and you don't think people should pay attention to the upswing either. No, that these are, these are just fluctuating not. numbers. No, no, they should um, pay attention to how we do over 10 years in the stocks we own. But, but actually the way the rule works now, uh, you know, every minute it's recorded in earnings. It's marked to market. And, and uh, we, we're buying stocks that, in some cases, we will hold 10, 20, maybe even longer years. And, and, and those companies are retaining earnings. They're reducing the number of shares. They've got a lot of things going for them. And uh, I would, you know, I, I have bet a lot of money. We had $173 billion of, of equities at year end. Uh, and 
I, I love having those, and they will make us money over time. But I have no idea what they'll do in the next year or two. All right, let, let's talk through a few other questions that have come in from viewers just regarding Berkshire while we're here. Eric LaFont wrote in and said, uh, Warren, how have you structured Greg Abel and Ajit Jain's compensation now that they oversee dozens of different businesses? You did point out that you think the business is much better run now that yeah. those two are vice chairman, each running their own set of companies. Yeah, our proxy will be out very soon. It shows what they uh, received. Uh, uh, I, th I think unless there's some calendar quirk or something like that, they will have uh, each received uh, $18 million last year. And, and uh, the, uh, the, the base salary is a high percentage of that, and then a, a bonus is discretionary with, with me. But they, they, they're doing a fabulous job. At, uh, bonus is discretionary just based on... It's based on how I wake up in the morning, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that same sort of... That, that may be the only one you'll read about like that at a proxy center. <laughs> <laughs> There's another question that comes in regarding uh, Greg and, and, and the Jeep that says, the, this is from The Rational Walk. A suggesting question on Monday, given that Abel and Jane are not only responsible for running most businesses, but also vice chairman, shouldn't they be up on stage along with Charlie at the annual meeting? Many of us would like to hear from them. Yeah, well, you will hear from them more in the sense that they, they will be up front with, with microphones ready to take on any questions that come. I, you know, we, there, there, it's not gonna be that many years where the two of us are, up on, they will be up on the stage when we rearrange the format. And rearranging the format means rearranging me and Charlie to some degree. Uh, but, and it's, it's, logic, it's logical for them. And I hope qu lots of questions get directed to them at the annual meeting, well, because we'll feed them into them. Uh, I should mention one thing about uh, their comp. Uh, there's this rule, and I may not be giving it to you exactly proper, but there's a rule for public companies that, that you get to deduct only a million dollars unless uh, for a compensation, unless the excess is tied to some formula. So everybody pays, you know, you can be running the super company of all time, and they tend to range the base salaries so they're a million or two million, and then call the rest something that qualifies huh. under the IRS where they get the deduction for it. And, I didn't know that's why. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> believe me, every company can own it, and, they, and their employment consultants know and everything. So you have all of these salaries, but then they have something that makes it very easy for them to make a lot more money, and, and that money is deductible, whereas I don't think what we pay in the way of excess, I think it's over a million, uh, uh, is deductible. But, I mean, it would be a joke. And uh, so we, we are paying them a fair amount of money, I believe, that's not deductible, whereas at any, almost any other company you see, that they're, they're designing it. Uh, so that it is deductible. I always wondered why base the base salary is yeah it's ridiculous. I mean, it's so transparent, but, but it makes everybody why. feel good. They, they passed it I don't know ten or twenty years ago, and uh, and immediately everybody oh we just had this revelation that now that you're really only worth a base salary of a tiny amount you know and and, and they came to me about designing something like this, you know, and I, I said, you know, it's just a joke. I mean, we're not going to pay them a million dollars a year. <laughs> so, you know, they've got huge responsibilities. So, so you'll see, you'll see a little different situation. Uh, uh, I think the bonus I give them, the, uh, I think it was 16 base and two bonus. I think the two is, is probably uh, deductible. <laughs> so 619 on the East Coast and you're already making friends. Well done. <laughs> uh, let's get to another question from the audience. This comes from Brian Chan. He asks, how are Ted and Todd's performance since they joined about eight years ago? The, the, the yeah. money managers who are there, uh, have they, uh, Ted Wetchler and Todd Combs, have they performed better than index? Charlie said recently that most money managers did not add any value compared to an index. Yeah. The the first few years, each of them, they came at a slightly different time, maybe a year to a year, year and a half or something different times. Uh, and uh, they got well ahead of the index and they got paid compensation. Now they got it paid, so it came in thirds so that it, it could be clawed back uh, two thirds of it if they missed the second year and so on. Uh, overall, they are a tiny bit behind the S&P 
each by just almost the same margin over the same time. Uh, over the entire period. Over the entire period. And the entire period is a little different for both of them. They now manage about 13 billion each. Mm -hmm. uh, they've, done, they've done better than I have. So I. Well, I'm, that's a good it, measuring stick. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, it isn't a measuring stick, but it, <laughs> it, uh, I, I, I mention it because uh, if I don't, somebody else will. So, you know. Uh, they also, both of them, have done an incredible amount of work uh, in terms of acquisitions, and uh, Todd, in particularly on our medical venture, uh, they, uh, anything at Berkshire, uh, we made a, an arrangement with uh, Lee Enterprises in terms of managing our newspapers. Ted handled all that. I mean, you know, he, he got my approval on it, but he did a million details, and and they're both. Uh, uh, they both have contributed all kinds of ways uh, to Berkshire, but uh, it has been a, it's been a tough time to beat the S and P, uh, and uh, but that's the deal we've got with them, and, and uh, uh, they've got a small carry forward of 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 deficiency to make up. I mean, they uh, they had some clawed back earlier. They made pretty good money uh, for a few years, uh, substantial. Uh, some of it was clawed back because of the three-year look-back arrangement, mm -hmm. and then now they've got a small carry forward. Okay. Um, another question that came but in. They've done better than I have. <laughs> I'm <laughs> <on> that clear. <laughs> uh, Tony Dickinson writes in: uh, What changes should we expect from Geico with the transition from Tony Nicely to Bill Roberts, and how do they approach leadership differently? Are they, they're they're two, two peas in a pod on that. I mean, they've worked together so long. They're so compatible. They have the same feelings about about Geico. Uh, uh, I mean, nobody can quite match Geico's uh, Tony's feelings about Geico. But they, uh, there's just no change. I, I was at a meeting of Geico that they had maybe 40 of their top executives, and everybody went around and introduced themselves and gave the length of time they'd been with Geico. I think the shortest time any one of those people said it was 19 years. <laughs> it, wow. uh, it, Geico grows its own. Warren, we're just sitting down with you for the first time since the news last week uh, that Kraft Heinz put out. Uh, there was so much news, it's hard to even summarize it yeah. all. When they came out with earnings that missed expectations. They said, by the way, it's not going to get better in 2019. They revealed that there's an SEC investigation taking place into accounting. Um, they wrote down the value of the brands by just over $15 billion. Uh, were you surprised by any of this news? What did you think of what happened? Because the street was surprised. So the stock was down over 30%. Yeah. Well, uh, I may have learned a week or 10 days before about something uh, like the SEC investigation. And I'm not, I'm not on the board, but Greg's on the board, and I talked to Greg. And, and Greg had been talking a lot to the head of the audit committee, and he's a terrific guy, Jack Pope. Uh, but uh, the write-down... Uh, I, I do my own write downs in my mind. Uh, 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 so I, I was not surprised by that, although uh, the accounting firms look at write downs a little differently than I do, but I would not argue with them on it. And uh, I can give you some math that would substantiate it. Uh, I've been watching, I was wrong in a couple ways on Kraft Heinz, but the, uh, I think we talked the glide luncheon time about the packaged goods uh, brands losing some ground against the retailers. Was always, that just over a year ago? Uh, six least. months ago. Okay. The, the, the Glide, uh, the, the packaged goods companies are always in a struggle with, with retailers. My, our family had a grocery store for 100 years, and we went through it. then we didn't have much bargaining power. But the really strong brands, uh, they can go toe to toe with Walmart or uh, Costco or whomever it may be. But the weaker brands uh, are, tend to lose out. Now, the interesting thing about, about Kraft Heinz is it's still a wonderful business in that it uses about seven billion of tangible assets and earns six billion pre-tax on that. So, so on the assets required to run the business, seven billion, uh, they earn six billion uh, roughly after depreciation pre-tax. But 
we and certain predecessors, but primarily we, we paid 100 billion more than the tangible assets. So for us, it has to earn on 107 billion, not just on the 7 billion that the, the business employs. And, and we don't have a way, it'd be wonderful we had a way to deploy another 7 billion and earn 6 billion, but, but it isn't there. So uh, I, think that, I think that when you're going toe to toe with a Walmart or a Costco or maybe an Amazon pretty soon, and, uh, at, and you have a, a, a modestly good brand, maybe one where the trend's a little against or something like that, you know, you've got the weaker bargaining hand than you had 10 years ago. The really classic situation is this, if you think about it, Becky. Heinz was started in 1869. Mm -hmm. so they've had all that time to develop various products, particularly ketchup, things like that. The craft part of it's a little more murky, but it goes back to CW Post in 1895. Those companies have brought all kinds of brands out, all kinds of, you know them, you had them when you were a kid, you, you have them Raising now, brand, some, some yeah, of them. Sure. They've been distributed worldwide through tens and hundreds of thousands of outlets. They've had hundreds of millions of trying. They spent a fortune on advertising. And their sales now are 26 billion. Costco introduced the Kirkland brand in 1992, you know, 27 years ago. And that brand did 39 billion last year, whereas all the Kraft and Heinz brands did 27, 26 or 7 billion. So here they are. 100 years plus, tons of advertising, built into people's habits and everything else. And now Kirkland, a private label band, comes along and with only 750 or so outlets, does 50% more business than all the Kraft Heinz brands. I mean, so house brands, private label, is getting stronger. It's, it varies by country around the world, but, but it's, it's, it's bigger, and it's going to keep getting bigger. Okay, a couple of questions on that. First of all, does that mean you overpaid? Well, we did overpay. We didn't overpay for Kraft. Uh, I mean, for, for oh, Heinz. Heinz. That, we bought that originally. It was a 50-50 deal. It's private. 50-50 deal with 3G. Pardon me? With 3G. Yeah, with 3G. We had two, two stockholders. And then we, we, overpaid, for, we overpaid for Kraft. And, and we wrote down $15 billion of that, and that... Uh, you know, and that, that's a CPA's work, way of looking at it. Actually, the markets marked it down more than that, and, uh, and, and probably quite properly. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the thing to remember is, like, you, know, you know how the stock doesn't know you own it. You pay $10 for a stock, it goes to 8 and you think if it gets back to 10 I'll sell it. You know, if it goes up to 20 you say, I can take out, sell half of it and take all my money out. All those things are nuts. But in, in business, uh, if we paid $7 billion for Kraft, which is all it takes to run the business, uh, it would still earn the same amount as if we paid the $100 billion premium. The stock, the business does not earn more just because you pay more for it. And we not only after buying Kraft, everybody started speculating about things we buy, so the prices of everything went up. And then on top of it, we paid large premiums for it, and, and we misjudged it. I hear what you're saying about the house brands and the competition from places like a private label brand that Costco puts out. But what, what about just millennials changing habits? How well, much of it is that younger consumers don't want the brands that their parents and grandparents there, wanted? There, 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 there's some change in habits, but if you think about it, people don't really change their habits that much. If you try to think of the billion dollar brands that have been created in food and their private label is, is there's very few billion dollar brands being created in food. The fellow did it in yogurt probably, you know. I mean, there's, but you don't really see that, that that has not been a huge change. Physical volume hasn't changed much. The ability to price, though, has been changed, and that's huge. We had an analyst on last week, on Friday, talking about what she perceived as the problems with Kraft Heinz. And she said she thinks they're underinvesting in the business. I mean, that's kind of been 3G's way to cut to the bone, and that's how you make, make this profitable. But she thinks the brands have been underinvested in. Would you yeah. agree with that? I don't think so, but that's hard for me to tell. Uh, but the, I see, well, I was on the board. I mean, I saw lots of innovation on, on different products, and you saw them advertised to some extent. I, I do not think, but I don't know this for sure, but I think if you take the 10 largest food companies. I, I think in, in, in innovation, uh, 
Uh, they've tried a lot of things, but how many things work? If you look at Kellogg and General Mills and go up and down the line, Coca-Cola, I mean, how many new products really become big? Uh, you read about them at all, <laughs> but, but uh, take Heinz ketchup, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, it's got 60% of the ketchup market, it's got higher percentages in other parts of the world, and uh, it's a very, very, very strong brand. Philadelphia cream cheese is a strong brand, but mm -hmm. other brands are weaker, and that you are right, certainly, that in certain categories, maybe in a Kool-Aid or, or uh, you know, Jell-O or something like that, uh, you know, they go back 75 years or something, and, and there's some secular trend against that, but that isn't the key. I mean, they cut costs not in, in innovation or in, in product quality or anything like that. They just took it out of SGNA, basically. Now, they may have, they may have made a mistake in terms of working, I shouldn't say they, we may have made a mistake, in terms of uh, trying to push hard against certain of the retailers and finding out that we weren't as strong as we thought they were, uh, we were. Let's go to one of the questions uh, from viewers because we got a lot of questions related sure. to Kraft Heinz. This one's number T5. Uh, someone named J.C. Dominguez wrote in, is this the type of incident in time when you buy more Heinz or do you pull the plug? Oh, we don't, we don't pull the plug on it. I mean, we, 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 we've never sold a share of, of Kraft Heinz. And, and if we sold or bought it has to be reported within two days. So we, we wouldn't be able to do anything significant. But it isn't, it isn't our, our, our style. We are the partners with, with, with 3G on it. And so we have exactly the number of shares we had before. And, uh, you know, I, I guess I should never say never at, at age 88 in terms of what somebody else might do. But I can tell you, I have absolutely no intention of selling. I've got absolutely no intention of buying. Why wouldn't, if, you, if you're sticking with the business and it's 30% cheaper today, why wouldn't you buy more? Well, because it isn't worth as much. <laughs> so you uh, think it was a fair I mean, write-down well, that the market At 35, gave you've got a billion, 200 million shares out. So uh, that's, that's 42 billion for the equity, and we owe 30, 30 or 31 billion. So the whole company is selling for 71 or $2 billion. And as I mentioned, it has about six billion of operating income. Now, for six, for six billion, would you pay a lot more than 72, where it doesn't look like it's going to be going up for a while? Maybe even, well, they said it was gonna go down in 2019. Uh, you know, we, uh, that is, uh, there are other things I think uh, where you get more for your money and, and better uh, prospects. Not that I regard the prospects for Kraft Heinz as terrible, I mean, be, uh, I would, if I had to bet one way or another, I think people will eat more of our products this year than, than last year. But if you see better places to deploy money, why don't you sell? We, we, you can't, uh, well, A, we can't, as a practical matter, move around tens of billions of dollars that easily. Uh, but beyond that, uh, uh, well, it, 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 it is, I mean, if we're working with a million dollars or $10 million, would I have a position in it? No, you know, I, 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 you move around with a million or 10 million. And Ted and Todd can move around reasonably well with 13, but that, that's going to be difficult. 173 billion. I mean, you, you are, you do, you know, you, you dance like a, an elephant, not, 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 not like some, some guy in Dancing with the Stars. We always have a sure winner, Joe. Uh, last year, it, it's true the favorites got knocked out early, uh, but, but we did split. There's a $100,000 consolation prize uh, for whoever does the best. Now, that got split eight ways last year, but, but the year before we had uh, five people that came within one game and just the last games of, of winning the million dollar prize. Now, if they'd won the million, they would have had to split it if all five had won it, but there's a million dollar prize. And uh, we're gonna do it again this year. And, and uh, uh, we limit it to employees of, I know. of, of Berkshire, but close personal friends of mine who have a brick uh, also may be entitled to enter. I want Joe, to, I he just, invited you to enter last year and you didn't do it. No, no, no. We were doing other things where, I, I, where depending, let, let's do it again this year, Warren, with, with a Creighton versus Xavier thing. Because 
They both have losing sort of records, and they, they're, they're not doing quite as well, although Creighton just beat Georgetown, and yesterday Xavier just beat uh, Villanova. I don't know if you saw. It was, it was pretty good. So let's do something there, and let's, uh, let's see. There's a NetJet card I can think about. I don't know what the payoff's, uh, payoff's <laughs> oh. going to be, but let's see who goes further. You can get another brick. <laughs> exactly, if I'm lucky. I get, I, get 30 sec I get 30 seconds on the program versus a NetJet membership for you. Is that it? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll let you name the bet, and I will let you name the stakes. And, okay. and uh, we'll go from there. Whoa. Really? This is the honor system, Joe. You know, yeah. okay, let's do that. Well, now but you're talking his language. He all, but, you know, he's very crafty and very smart. Like, like he, he sent me a NetJet card. It had my name on it, but it was absolutely useless. It was like a, a you know, it was like I use it as a <laughs> luggage tag. It, was, it wasn't worth anything. Yet, well, you said... You said NetJet cards. You didn't say it had to work for extra yeah, that, flights. That, that's a starter card. That's a starter card, Joe. Oh, we got big things in plan for you. I do have great things to talk to you about. I'm worried. I, I mean, I think you think the market's expensive, Warren. So I want to talk to you about that. I mean, you don't like to say that, and yeah. you say long term it's going to be fine. But you've got a lot of metrics you're looking at there, like the uh, market cap to GDP or GNP. That that's. That, that looks expensive there, right? I mean, there are things that look expensive, and you're having trouble finding things. So, to, you know, you need to be honest with us about that. Is it really expensive? The market, Joe, if it, it, it depends on interest rates. We've talked about that before. Uh, it, if you tell me that 3% long bonds will prevail over the next 30 years, stocks are incredibly cheap. Okay. Because even, you know, I mentioned that Kraft Heinz earns $6 billion on seven billion of tangible assets. Yeah. Even if you pay 70 billion and you earn six billion on it, that's better than having 70 billion out in 3% government. Interest rates govern everything. And, and if there were a way to short 30 year bonds and, and own the S&P for 30 years, I would, I would give you enormous odds that the S&P is going to beat 30 year bonds. Now, we've had this period of extended long-term low rates, not only here, but around the world. And now it looks like we're not going to jack them up very fast. So we may be in a new world, the world that Japan entered back in 1990. And if so, stocks will, when we look back on it, will look very cheap. But, you know, this has not been the history of the United States to have these continued low interest rates. So uh, I, there's no, if I, if I had a choice today for a 10-year purchase, of a 10-year bond at whatever it is, or 10 years, or, or buying the S&P 500 and holding it for 10 years, I'd, I'd buy the S&P in a second. Well, that, that brings us to a question that a viewer wrote in. Uh, this is T67. Uh, Piyush Pant says, from the annual report in the 13F, it looks like Berkshire was the least active in the public markets in the quarter when the stocks were the cheapest. You also did fewer buybacks in the fourth quarter when Berkshire was cheaper. Was taking the foot off the gas in the fourth quarter a conscious decision? And based on what you just said, we got all these signs that, that looked like the Fed was not going to be raising rates in the fourth quarter, too. So why wasn't that a buy signal for you? Well, I, I thought stocks were a buy in the fourth quarter, just like they did in the third and second and first quarter. But sometimes we have other things in mind, too, that may use a lot of money. And sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. But, but What, does but, that mean you were holding your cash in case a deal came through? Uh, we had at least one deal possibly that would have been very large. And uh, hmm. so uh, we, we, uh, I liked stocks in the fourth quarter, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, like, I would like buying a business even better. Is that deal? And incidentally, I, I did say in the annual report that we expect to be buyers, net buyers of stocks in this year. We have not been net buyers, I should point out. I mean, the market's gone pretty much straight up. Uh, I, I still think stocks are more attractive, but I have trouble buying it one every day and up. <laughs> the deal that you just mentioned, is that potentially still on the books? No. So it's no, an I don't think I don't think it is, no. Is it a deal here in the United States? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is it bigger than a, yeah. <laughs> is it bigger than a bread box? I, I'll, just, I'll, I'll give you a hint, it's on this planet. <laughs> <laughs> So you went out of your way in the letter to say that you do think buying businesses outright is more expensive, even though you don't think stocks are too expensive. No, no here. question that, yeah, it, you, in 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 this in stocks now you have a or businesses I should say 
you have a huge, huge, huge uh, buyer. And, and, and that's not only, and companies are eager to buy too, but you also have private equity. And if, I don't know how, whether private equity, it's, it's flexible because they can call on their partners for more money and all that. But let's just assume that they would have a trillion available. Now, they use a lot of leverage. They call themselves private equity, but they're really private debt you know, to a great extent. But that, that trillion might buy as much as, say, three trillion of assets if it's leveraged with, with uh, two trillion of debt. Well, the total stock market is something like 30 trillion. And, and if you take the top five companies, you knock another, or six companies, you knock four, five, four trillion off that. So uh, you're down to something where the buying power uh, uh, of, of private equity, plus just the normal buying power from companies that want to get there, it's just a huge amount of competition. When you start looking around, is that, do you think the private equity companies are overpaying for this, or can they well, make it I, work? They'd rather not. I mean, they obviously want to make the best deals they can, but they are in a game that is so much more competitive than it was for them. If you go back to the 1970s, when, you know, when, when, when leverage buyouts started, which are the same thing they're doing now, but the, the name kind of lost its appeal there at some point, but, but the deals you could make then uh, were enormously more attractive than the deals you could make now. Let, let me ask you one more question that came in from a viewer. You've, you've kind of answered this, but there, there may be a little bit more uh, to the answer. This is T84 for the control room. Uh, Nick writes in, why didn't a large acquisition happen for Berkshire during the fourth quarter 2008 sell-off? Are you anticipating a much bigger decline in the market? Or was, I, I guess maybe it was the timing of it. Maybe it was so quick. Yeah. Well, there too, in, in 2008, for example, we were going to buy Constellation Energy. We, we ended up buying the stock and making uh, some money on it. But, but that was part of a deal. When Constellation fell apart, and it was in the fall of 2008, uh, both I was watching the tape, Dave Sokol was watching what was going on, and we actually called each other at the same time, and he was on a plane with Greg to Baltimore. Greg Abel? Yeah, mm -hmm. that day. Uh, and. And we, we we contracted to buy it, uh, so we we were we were ready to buy that, and we we tried on other things, and we but we participated in marketable securities big time at that point too, as you know. Mm -hmm. we, we spent I think we spent 16 billion dollars in three weeks, where when, when nobody else was spending anything. When was that? What? <laughs> well, between about S September 15th and October 7th or 8th. And then we already had another three billion committed to Dow, which was not going to get taken down till later on. So we went through our cash pile pretty fast, too fast, actually. You have a huge cash pile right now, though. What we is it? One hundred twelve billion dollars. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're. And that doesn't even count the other twenty billion in in cash-like. No, that does count. Uh, I mean, uh, but uh, but the hundred and ten or something like 13, that. Thirteen, whatever. That, it was, yeah, yeah. That, that that counts twenty, and. and you know, I never get right down to 20 anyway, but, but we've got a lot of cash and we'd love to use it. But we're a private equity firm that's going to borrow <clears throat> six or seven times what they call EBITDA, which I don't use as a metric. Uh, they're going to pay more than we are. And, you know, as I said, we, we paid too much for capital. If you pay too much for something, it doesn't accommodate you by earning more money <laughs> to make you look good. It, it earns what it earns. And <clears throat> if we'd paid... If we paid $10 billion less for craft, it would have still earned the same money, you know, basically. Um, this question that comes in, this is F7 control room. Doug Wolford writes in, Warren, when you come across bad news on a holding, for example, Kraft Heinz, can you share the sequence of criteria you use to determine if the stock is on sale and buy or a bust and to sell? What really concerned you as, as, as what is in... What is, as to what is in back of a dip? Like, yeah. The stock market is there not to instruct me. It's there to serve me. So if, it, if, if there's bad news and the stock goes down, the question is, and uh, I have, is, is, is the long-term valuation changed? And, uh, you know, there was, well, there was certainly bad news at Geico when we bought it, for example, but there was bad news in American Express when I originally bought it back in the 60s. It was the best investment the partnership ever made. And so what you like is, bad news about a fundamentally good business. <laughs> and 
then you got to make sure that it's still a fundamentally good business. But uh, no, bad, bad news on a good business. We're better off because Apple stock is down significantly from where it was four or five months ago than if it stayed there. Apple will probably, they may not, but they have said they're going to go down to cash neutral. Mm -hmm. They could do it either by acquisitions or dividends or repurchases. And my guess is it'll be mostly repurchases. They're about $130 billion away from cash neutral now. If the stock were at 200, it would buy 650 million shares. If it's at you know, 150, you, know, you buy close to 900 million shares. Uh, we're way better off you know, if it's, a, if it's at a lower price when they're repurchasing shares. Our partners are selling out to us and they're selling out cheaper than otherwise. The worst thing that can happen for, from our standpoint with Apple is it sells at 230 or something like that because we don't like buying it as well at that sort of price. The camel, yeah, it, well, I was back at Geico 10 days ago and the camel was running well ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, you should win I, I, some type of uh, of mad, uh, uh, you know, mad men or advertising men. Mad men. You, you single-handedly, uh, you know, turned that into, you know, uh, people need to do that. If I mean Geico, what the heck is a Geico? It's a government of Martin, you know, it would have gone I, nowhere. But you you ramped up all that ad spending and look at it now. So, I mean, you you really it's sort of uh, they owe you the the whole advertising industry. I'm Joe. I. I I am so glad that you remember that I was the one that came up with the idea of Geico, the Geico, I, uh, the Gecko. I mean, that they, lizard. People, people at Geico seem, people at Geico misremember that entire. They think it was their idea, and I remember the, the way days I sketched that little guy out and said, "Why don't yeah. we try the?" <laughs> that happens on the show a lot. I know. We don't. Neither one of us get credit where we, uh, you know, that people forget what we yeah, do. Yeah, I know that. All right. Yeah. Well, it's the heavy our day will come. <laughs> Hey, hey, Warren, let's, let's talk a little bit about what Joe was just talking about. And Joe, stay there, because I know you wanted to ask about BYD. That might play into this. Um, the trade talks with China. Yeah. Um, how big of a deal is that? What have you seen on your companies, on your investments? Well, I see the monthly reports from the companies come through. And a, a, a fair number, uh, you know, not an in insurance at all, obviously, but, but a, a, a fair number of uh, the tariffs have had some impact. Now we're talking 10 percent tariffs. Uh, uh, and they, uh, a number of them say, if it, get, if it were 25 percent, there'd be some big adjustments. Some of it, the suppliers have swallowed over in China. And uh, some we split with them. But, but it, it, it pushes prices up. I mean, there's, just, there's no question about that. Uh, but it hasn't had a big effect at 10 percent. Uh, a number of them have told me at 25 percent, I mean, the world changes. I mean, you either get a lot more money for your product or you source it differently or you, you do something. So are you relieved to hear of the, the deadline being extended and being pushed off that March 2nd, it's not all going to go to 25 percent? Well, I'm relieved at the idea that, that there's still some chance that sense will prevail. Uh, I, the, it is bad for China. It's bad for us. Uh, if we get into some kind of a trade war, and 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 uh, you know negotiations are tough in something like this. This is a, a big deal to both both countries, and to some extent, you're playing a game of chicken, and because it hurts both countries. Uh, and I I generally think when two very smart countries have something very important at stake, they'll end up making rational decisions. I mean, I've been figuring that way with the with the Russians ever since uh, you know the nu the nuclear bomb I, uh, that even though you get all kinds of tensions and people generally figure out what's best for themselves and the best thing for both China and the United States is to work out something uh, sensible that both sides can live with. Did you think there was valid reason for amping up these negotiations for saying hey, hey hang on a second we're not getting a fair shake. Well, I think we haven't been getting a fair shake to some degree, but I think we can sustain. I mean, to some extent, uh, the United States can do things that no other country can do. So I, as I think a number of smaller countries, for example, if they want to run trade surpluses with us, I mean, and, the, and it strengthens their economy. It doesn't hurt us that much. I mean, I think we've got a role to play in the world that way, but I don't think we can be 
Uncle Sap <laughs> either. Uh, Joe, you have some breaking news? Yeah, out of the General Electric, uh, breaking to a lot of us that uh, we realized GE had this much money uh, tied up in biopharma. Uh, the company General Electric is selling its biopharma business to Danaher. Kind of interesting, uh, Danaher, for $21.4 billion, and $21 billion of that will be in cash. GE says it's going to use the proceeds uh, to reduce leverage, uh, strengthen its balance sheet. It expects the deal uh, to close during the fourth quarter uh, of this year. And it, there's, there's, a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of comments about how, you know, from Culp about how this uh, is in keeping with their plan to uh, reduce leverage, uh, strengthen the balance sheet. Uh, and uh, all the other things. The deal, uh, Danaher, meanwhile, sees the deal adding 45 to 50 cents to adjusted earnings per share in the first full year. And um, instead of us talking about this, uh, Becky, me or you, I guess uh, we should get Warren's uh, comments on what let, he thinks let, of this move. Let's, let's do just that. And I do want to bring up, uh, this is something, Warren, that we got viewer questions about, too, randomly, yeah. GE. Uh, control Room T102, Brian Savage wrote in, Mr. Buffett, given the recent turmoil with GE, do you believe Larry Culp is the right man for the job? And if you could advise him, what would you inform him he should do? Lastly, if he is the guy, why haven't you invested in a company like GE, given your current funds? Yeah. Well, I think he should sell uh, uh, the medical operation for $21.4 billion to Danner. I mean, <laughs> that sounds, I, I, I think that, that GE should deleverage. Uh, no great insights there. I, they, they believe the same thing, I'm sure. Uh, so uh, they just, they owe, they owe more money than they sh should at present, and, and, and they should sell assets to some degree, not, not in a fire sale at all. And so this is not a fire sale price. So I, I, I applaud what, they, what was just announced. Uh, uh, and uh, I met Larry at a terrific record at Danner. At, uh, and uh, uh, you know, we are a big customer of GE. We are a big supplier of GE. You know, I've had some connection with the company for for decades, and they did call us in 2008 when they needed money. And uh, so, I, uh, I, I think I think all America is cheering for GE, but I'm certainly one of those that is cheering. Have they called you more recently? Well, I, I've I've talked to them off and on over the last year or two, but uh, uh, you know, and I, I, but I. I've said the same thing pretty much uh, as what I'm saying right here. Mm -hmm. um, Joe, you have other questions on this front? Um, not so much uh, on that. I got a lot of things, obviously, that, that, uh, that we want to talk about. And I guess Warren probably does know GE pretty well. Does he have, I'd like a little more color to his comments on GE. He probably doesn't want to do that. What do you, what's your expression? What do you say? You, you criticize by uh, just generally, but you praise uh, yeah. by category. Uh, criticize yeah. by category, praise by name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so I, I, I guess I, I can't read, get you to I, just I slam read their GE, huh? I, or ML or no, anything. No, huh? no huh? you'll never get me. No? You'll never get me to do that. What a you'll mess, though, no. right? And, uh, <laughs> I haven't seen their 10K yet. I mean, I want to get their 10K as soon as I can. And, and uh, uh, it, may, it may be, it's probably out just about now. Uh, and that, that's, that's the document you have to read. Uh, well, it's up about 50% from the lows, I guess. About, more, huh? Yeah. More than that, yeah. But it's, it's you know, it's, 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 it's selling, the equity is selling for about 100 Hundred million dollars, hundred billion dollars, and 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 then they have, uh, they actually have a preferred issue that's five or six billion. And most people don't even know about that. Uh, and then they have, uh, they had, uh, you know, something over a hundred billion of debt. I'm consolidating the GE capital, but I think that's the way to look at it. Uh, and they've got a, they've got a couple of very good businesses. So. Uh, but but they're, they were over leveraged and they've got to reduce the leverage and and clearly they're doing it. I mean you could write uh, Warren, a check a for that. Question that comes uh, in. Warren, you could write a check for that, Warren, if you really liked it. That that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's true that you could, but you won't be. Okay, uh, I'll just uh, paraphrase. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> 
there's a question that came in from a viewer, uh, and I ask this because we're talking about GE, and it's one of many companies that's looking at unfunded pension liabilities potentially down the road. This is T54 Control Room. Brian Bannon writes in, how do you see the unfunded pension liabilities across the United States affecting our economy over the next 10 years? Well, if you're talking about the corporate sector, mm -hmm. uh, the unfunded liabilities have been working their way down because all the new companies don't go for divine benefit plans. So you've got, you know, if you take the four or five largest companies in the United States, they don't, they don't have divine benefit plans. We have bought a number of older companies. So we have, we have a fair number of companies with defined benefit plans. We wouldn't start any defined benefit plans. But, but that, it's, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a huge problem in corporate America. I mean, you have a Sears and the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corp gets involved, and, and there'll, be, there'll be others, but, but uh, it's way less of a problem than it was 10 years ago or, 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 or 20 years ago. Uh, in the public sector, you know, it's a disaster. And, uh, uh, you know, some of the, it's interesting to me when they talk about these relocation problems, you know, and New York and Amazon, all that sort of thing. You know, I, I, if I were relocating into some state that had a huge unfunded pension plan, I'm walking into liabilities because, I mean, who knows whether they're going to get it from the corporate income tax or my employees, uh, you know, with, with personal income taxes or what. But that, that liability isn't going to, you can't, you can't ship it offshore or anything That's like that. And those are big numbers, really big numbers. And they may come, you, you can delay a long time. I mean, you may, you're getting pushed maybe somewhat. But the politicians are the ones that really haven't attacked it in a good many states. And when you see what they would have to do, uh, I say to myself, why do I want to build a plant there that has to sit there for 30 or 40 years? Because I'll be here for the life of the, the pension plan. And they will come after corporations. They'll come after individuals. They, they just, they're going to have to raise a lot of money. I, I, I mean, when you say that, the states that come to mind, having not looked at those statistics in a while, would be Illinois and New Jersey at the yeah. top of the list. Well, as I say, I... I praise my name and <laughs> criticize my category. <laughs> well, well, let's talk about the decision of Amazon to say forget it to a second headquarters yeah. in New York City. Uh, we were with Charlie Munger on that day. This was uh, February 14th, just a, a week and a half ago. Um, we were with Charlie Munger the day that announcement came out, and Charlie had some pretty uh, firm comments on it. He said he thinks it's crazy that states like California and others are basically driving the rich people out. What do you think about it? Well, I, I heard Charlie on that, and as he says, they, <laughs> they, they don't have kids. <laughs> uh, they don't, and, and a good many of them are charitable. They tend to give them things that are around them, uh, and they don't use the services nearly as much relative to their taxes that they pay as the average person. Uh, uh, and they, yeah, he says they use the hospitals. <laughs> now, no, I obviously, well, a state like Florida, which has no income tax, mm -hmm. attracts a lot of rich people, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, in Texas, uh, you know, when people ro relocate there, the fact that, that uh, there's no income tax uh, is a real factor. And, and I don't know about those two, two states specifically, but I, I have a feeling that their retirement plans are in pretty good shape compared to the old industrial states. Uh, you get legacy liabilities when you move in. Uh, Nebraska's in very good shape uh, that, uh, uh, for a long time. Uh, we've really been against the state having any debt. Now they get around that with leasing sometimes. But. Well, you, what we're talking about is state versus state. Yes. You're now talking about some new taxation plans that are being uh, recommended in Congress or by specific senators or congressmen um, that are similar to some of, the, some of those policies that we've seen in the states. I mean, if you just run through it, uh, Elizabeth Warren with her wealth tax on anybody over $50 million, um, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, with her plan to tax anything above $10 million at 70% rate, uh, Bernie Sanders with his estate tax going up to 77%. If those policies are enacted on a national basis, do you see that same sort of trading off where people would potentially leave the United States? What do you think about these plans? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. I would say this. If tomorrow 
everybody in the world had a chance to make a one-time change in where they lived. Every fa two billion families all over the world. The only time they're going to get the chance to make the change. But they will get transported free to any country they want to go, their family, and have citizenship. What do you think is going to happen tomorrow? A lot of people going to the United States. A lot of people are going to come to the United States. Very few people are going to leave. North Korea might have a small <laughs> decrease in population. Mm -hmm. I mean, the point is, I mean, this is an incredible country. And it's true that right now we're raising $3.3 trillion and spending probably $4.3. We're going to have a debt of a deficit of about a trillion in a very good year in the cycle. I mean, when, a year of prosperity. And that's 5% of GDP. And that's probably more than that. You can actually take a 2 to 3% uh, deficit and not have the ratio of debt to GDP grow. But when five in prosperous years, we're, we're out of whack on that. So we, you know, you can cut spending, you can raise taxes. But I would say that, that the wealthy are definitely undertaxed relative uh, to the general population. But your answer, to, that, that was almost a dodge of the question. I mean, if these policies drive out the wealthy people, Sure, if you got your choice of where to go, everybody would want to come to the United States, but would the wealthy people do that if we changed our tax structure? Well, I, th I, I think uh, most of the people that have, the rich people, <laughs> Mark Rich <laughs> being one of them, I mean, they, they leave because they, in this case, I mean, you know, he's leaving before the feds pick him up. Uh, and uh, I don't think, if you offered most of the rich people, if they were sane anyway, and you said, <laughs> Uh, if you stay, we're going to take half your net worth, and if you leave, you can take it all with you. And you're 88 years old like me. You know, am I, am I going to leave the United States? You know, I could move. South Dakota has no state income tax. Wyoming has no state income. So I, we've got two states that border Nebraska. Nebraska has a seven and a fraction percent state income tax. If Iowa, which is right across the river, had no income, tax, I wouldn't move. I mean, it. it, it uh, uh, now I. I think people want to come here. I think if you made that offer I made the United States, there'd be more people come to the United States than any place else. And they would come, they would come if the deficit was one trillion or one point two trillion. I but mean this is the land of opportunity. Do you think they're good policies? Do you think they're good tax policies? Yeah. Warren, you're 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 making a, a decision to to leave all your money to the private sector in terms of, of charities and, and because you think, I, I assume you right. think maybe it'd be better spent there than, than by the government. Isn't it possible that, that it's just not the right idea to, to, to just what, what's already a bloated, uh, you know, what, what some people would think, a bloated entity, and, and address the spending side of things or else maybe you ought to reconsider if you think the government is so good at, at, at spending money, well, why leave it all in the private sector? Go ahead and give it all to the government and let them do it. You seem to have a, an idea that it, it's yeah. better treated if you do it, it philanthropically. I, I've got about four choices, Joe. I mean, let's say I have $80 billion. A, I could spend it all, you know. And, uh, 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 but even to spend it all, I would have to uh, sell Berkshire stock so I would incur taxes of, of, you know, 20 or so billion dollars in spending. So the government would then get 20 if I wanted to spend it all. I, could, I don't know what in the world I'd spend it on. I, right. can, I can give it all to my wife on death and then there's no tax. Right. Uh, I can give it, I could give 4 million people uh, $20,000 each uh, <laughs> and there'd be no, well, I, 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 there'd be no tax on it. As long as I give, make gifts to separate people, uh, up to 20,000, uh, I, can, I, I, can, I, can, I can do that, there's no tax. One thing you, one thing you could do, uh, the, the estate tax is the wealth tax. I mean, in theory, you get taxed on wealth on the estate. Now, you're allowed to give to charity 50% cash, 30% appreciated stocks, and have it deductible from your, from your income. Uh, they let you essentially deduct all the gifts of wealth at, at death. So you could, you, could have, you could have a limitation that you could only give 50% to philanthropy and, and, and uh, treat it the same way actually as, 
as uh, if you're giving away from income during your life. There's a lot of things you can do with the tax law. I mean, the tax, uh, uh, and I think that one way or another, when the Forbes 400 have gone from 93 billion to 2.7 trillion since 1982, uh, the market system, as it gets more specialized, will give more and more to the top people. If we were back in 1800 and we were all working on farms, you'd probably be worth a little more than I am because you'd work harder and be stronger. But the top person working on that farm would be worth one and a half to maybe two times what the bottom person was. But as we get more and more specialized, the guy that's the best in knocking out some other guy that weighs 200 pounds is, you know, is worth $30 million a fight. Now, he's worth $30 million a fight because somebody invented television and cable vision. Uh, it, as we get more specialized, the rich will get even richer. And the question is, how do you take care of the guy who's a wonderful citizen and father would, you know, may have died in Normandy or something, and, and, and it just doesn't have market skills. And I think the earned income tax credit's the best way to, to address that question, and, and that means probably some more taxes. It should mean some more taxes for guys like me, and however you come at it, I'm fine with. We've talked about a lot of things so far, but we have not gotten your take on the economy to this point. Um, there was just a Federal Reserve report out on Friday that suggested that GDP for 2018 is, is probably going to come in slightly below 3 percent. What do you think the economy is doing right now, just based on your businesses, based on the receipts you see, uh, the companies that you track that you have major, purchase, major shares in? Uh, right now, uh, just based on the monthly statements I get, and in some cases I get other data in between, but uh, the overall things are a little better. Uh, I mean, the rate of the rate of improvement has tapered, but it certainly hasn't flattened. Uh, now that could change next month. And, and uh, home construction has been dis disappointing, uh, uh, but most of our businesses. Uh, I would, I mean, uh, I've seen other figures on retail that are strong, uh, uh, you know, including Walmart's. But I would say our retail figures in January were not strong. But but. January is a peculiar month. That can be affected a lot by weather, although any retailer will always <laughs> like things on the weather. Uh, I, uh, no, I, right now things, th things look fine. When you say it's, it's a little better, that's relative to when. What are you, what's your comparison period? Well, I'm, I'm saying that if it, if, it, if it developed, as I see in January and February for the whole year, I think we would probably beat our 24.8 billion, but that would depend on insurance profits because swing either way. They are of your unrelated. operating profit that you just reported. But the operating, yeah. 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 So I, no, I, business looks, looks decent. It's not galloping ahead, and the tariffs having a little effect at 10 percent. If they went to 25, they would, they would change things quite a bit. And I, I do see some more inflationary things, but uh, no, I, I don't see anything to be alarmed about at present. What inflationary But incidentally, if, if you told me GDP would be down this year, I'd, we'd still be doing the same things, pretty much. What uh, inflationary signs do you see at this point? Well, we just, as I get the reports from the companies, they say these raw material costs are going up and, and uh, now, oil being down helps us. I mean, that's the basis for a lot of raw material costs. But uh, overall, I, there, there's more cost pressure. You, you mentioned that housing has been weaker, um, home building, home that you've building. seen that. Why, why do you think that is? It's puzzling because, you know, it, before 2008, you know, we were running higher. Well, I mean, the one obvious answer, you expect, uh, you expect household formations to go way down in a recession, and we had a bad one. But... You've had this big trend uh, from home ownership <clears throat> to renting, so that uh, you know that's probably changed by five percentage points. Well, five percentage points when you talk about 125 million households or six million houses, or people that are living in rental units rather than houses. So that that configuration has really changed, and I would have thought it would have turned back uh, as. People got the jobs back and all of that, but uh, 
single family construction is really, uh, uh, I think it's been quite weak compared to what you would expect after 10 years of recovery in with the stock market, you know, quadrupling from the lows and unemployment at 3.7%. Uh, people are just making different choices. Jay Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, is set to testify before Congress on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. Um, based on what you said about the weakness in housing, based on some of the downturn that you saw, did you think he made the right move uh, by signaling a much more dovish take last, last quarter? Yeah, I don't, <clears throat> I don't second guess him at all. I think he's a terrific choice for Federal Reserve chairman. He, he actually was at the Treasury in 1991 when Solomon was in trouble. And I saw him make a lot of very good decisions for the United States government. He's a smart man and he's, he's very level-headed. And he, he, he understands both business and economics. And I don't think he could have a better chairman. So I, I will never second guess him. I, I know you don't make a lot of investing decisions based on what the Federal Reserve chief or anybody else is saying, but what would you be interested in hearing from him this week? What, what, I, might, what might you be listening for? Well, I, I read what he says, but it doesn't affect anything we do. Like it, it just doesn't. I mean, it doesn't affect it in investments or in, you know, the, the amount of money we're going to spend on the railroad this year and energy or anything. We, we're plowing ahead always. We always spend more than our depreciation. And we know the country is going to make lots of progress over time, and we don't think we're smart enough to jump in and out as to when the time is. A couple of questions that came in from viewers when it comes to the economy. Uh, one is uh, T19 control room. Rashad Khan asking, do you think the 10-year yields are likely to rise from current levels in the long run? I don't know what the long run is. Yeah. Well, I'm amazed that 10 years into a recovery or nine years into the recovery, 10 years from uh, the panic, uh, uh, the, uh, I'm amazed that rates worldwide are what they are. This is not classical economics to have trillions and trillions of dollars still at negative interest rates with the world doing really very, very well. I, I don't know, I, I, you know, I, I don't understand it. I don't think the economists really understand it. I mean, it, it, oh, they got to explain it somehow. Uh, but that's the real, the real question for stock investors are, are, are these rates more or less a new normal? And uh, people who thought the Japanese rates in 1990 uh, couldn't possibly stay where they were. You know, that, that turned out to be suicide for the people that shorted Japanese bonds and so on. It, 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 we live in a world that wasn't described in classical economics. Do you think it's because of the experimentation <clears throat> by central banks around the globe? Well, I think that the central banks did what they had to do after 2008 and 2009. In fact, I think Europe was a little late doing it, but when Draghi finally said, we'll do whatever it takes, the only one that can say that is central banks. And I think central banks behaved very well uh, post uh, the recession. You've mentioned twice this morning um, how we could potentially be in a situation like Japan, where these interest rates stay at these incredibly low levels. Will it work out better for us than it has for Japan? Well, the, the answer is I just don't know. But Japan also has a declining population and <clears throat> no energy resources. and. Uh, I, we're a different case than Japan. <clears throat> um, we're here at the Nebraska Furniture Mart today, and I know that you've talked a little bit before we came on the show this morning just about Rose Blumkin, who founded the Nebraska Furniture Mart. You bring up immigration, so I thought maybe now would be a good time to talk about that. She came here in 1917. Yeah, she came over here on a boat from Yokohama, and she landed in Seattle, and I've got the manifest of the boat and here, and I've got her entry papers, and she, and, uh, she couldn't speak a word of English. Uh, the Red Cross got her to Fort Dodge, Iowa, where her husband was. Uh, she spent two years there, couldn't pick up the language there, so they decided to come to Omaha, where there were some Russian Jews, and they would feel at least they had uh, a home of sorts. And uh, she sold used clothing and did various things, had four children. And 15 or so years later, she'd saved $2,500. And you're in what was, became the largest home furnishing store in the country, except we now have a larger one in Texas. But, but in the 50-something largest market, 
she took $2,500 and turned it into the largest home furnishing store. And the punchline is that she couldn't read or write. And uh, I've got a contract here uh, that we signed. This is what I came out with. I typed this up in 1983, August 30. Pages? Yeah, it's, 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 it's really just one page. Uh, I mean, this is a signature page here. <laughs> and that's her signature at the top, and as you can see, it's just a scrawl. Mm -hmm. And we did not get an audit. We did not look at the property uh, records to see. I just said, Mrs. B, do you owe any money? And she says, no. And I, that was it. And I, we, How much did you pay? Well, at that time, <clears throat> we bought, we, the, we rearranged things within the family something. So we, in effect, bought 80% at a value uh, of $60 million uh, uh, on a 100% basis. But we had, uh, well, we just, we, we, we shook hands. And uh, I felt like I had the Bank of England on the other side. And, uh, and then she went on to work until she was 103. Uh, if any of my managers are out there listening, that's sort of a yardstick we use now <laughs> on retirement. And uh, was a marvelous, marvelous woman. And when, never went to school a day in her life. And when the family sat down for dinner, they sang God Bless America before eating. Uh, it, you know, it, it's an incredible story. Warren, in the annual letter this year, you write about the American tailwind. Yeah. What? Well, as I point out in there, I've, on this March 11th in a couple of weeks, it'll be 77 years since I bought my first stock. And I paid $114.75 for three shares of city service preferred. But if you had bought, if you'd been a pension fund and you put a million dollars into the S&P 500 at that time and reinvested it, during my investing lifetime, that, that million would have turned into 5.3 billion. You would have gotten for every dollar you put in, you've gotten over $5,000 without ever reading a headline, an annual report, you didn't have to know accounting, you just had to believe in America. And you didn't have to pick the right stock, you just picked America. And if that isn't a tailwind, it's more like, it's more like a hurricane. I mean, it is, uh, American business has done incredibly well, and America's done incredibly well. And, uh, you know, and I go back and I point out that there were two 77-year periods before that and that takes us back to George Washington getting inaugurated. And there wasn't anything here then. And now you have $108 trillion of household wealth in the United States. You know, we, we've got something that works. And that framework wasn't that we were working harder, it wasn't that we were smarter, but we had a framework that unleashed human potential. And just think of that, 377 year periods, one of which I experienced. And you couldn't help, but all you had to do was believe in America. And, and you got very, very, you didn't have to read the newspapers, you know, nothing. You didn't have to pick a stock. That worked the last 77 years, but there's a question that came in, T29. This is from Scott Baker. With so many people in the S&P index funds, is it still market neutral and the best investment vehicle for most people? Yeah, I think it's the best investment, because most people don't know how to pick stocks. And, and most of the time, I don't know how to pick stocks. I mean, it's, it is not an easy game. And by definition, people are going to do average. I mean, if you take everybody in, in aggregate, and if half of them are paying big fees and jumping around and paying brokerage commissions, the other half have to do better. And, and uh, no, it is, as I've told people, and, and my, my widow will, get, I've instructed uh, the trustee to put 90% in, in, in an S&P 500 index fund and 10% in governments, just so that, just for a feeling of security. But, but uh, there's been no better bet than America. There's been nothing like it. There was one question that came in from, this is F20, Ahmad Abu Rashid, who said, would a strong and sustained shift to the left in fiscal and economic policy rip away at American business tailwinds moving forward? Yeah, well, my, my dad thought, you know, communism was coming in the 30s. <laughs> and then, you know, he was very anti-Roosevelt. I, I, all my life I've been hearing half the country say that if the other the person favored by the other half wins, things are gonna to go to hell. And so I pointed out in my discussion, I've lived under 15 presidents 
14 of them I've invested under. I didn't invest under Hoover. I was a little young. Man. But seven were Republicans, seven were Democrats. I mean, it, it, after this last election in, 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 in 2016, my, most of my friends were for Hillary. And they thought, you know, sell stocks, you know, dig a cave, do whatever it might be. And I told them they're crazy. You know, it, it, uh, uh, you do not want to have a political view in investing. And most people put it through a political prism. They just can't keep their politics out of it. They can keep their religion out of it. Or with politics, they just have to look through those glasses. And if, if, you'd, if you'd done that, if you'd been a staunch Republican or a staunch Democrat through these 77 years, you'd have missed out on a lot of the party. <laughs> what about now when the parties are kind of in flux? Donald Trump was not a typical Republican, and no. Bernie Sanders now looks like he's leading the way in some of these polls. He wasn't even a Democrat until recently. He's a socialist his whole life who just caucused with the Democrats. Well, he, he was an interesting candidate in 2016 because I would, uh, you know, he, he came close and I would say that 90% of the people who voted for him hadn't heard of him two years earlier. That's really unusual. Uh, 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 it's given hope to a whole lot of other people who are entering this time. Uh, uh, when you look at what Sanders did, when you look at what Trump did, it, a whole lot of people look at the mirror now and say, well, man, you know, that could be me. Uh, so Sanders, the big appeal I think he had was he came, he had unusual authenticity. I mean, they all want to seem authentic, and they, they are authentic in a certain way, but they, they do move around as the polls come in and their advisors come in. You had the feeling when you listened to Bernie that he was saying exactly what he believed. Now, you can agree with it or not, but that's a very appealing uh, uh, characteristic in a candidate. It may, not, it may not be enough to carry anybody to victory, but it, is a, it, it makes people notice you. They, uh, they, they really do know to some extent whether you believe what you're saying when you're out there on the stump. And, and Bernie, really, he really did hate billionaires <laughs> and, and, and the campaign financing. I mean, he was talking authentically, and he's still talking. I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll absolutely give him that. Do you agree with his policies or his proposed well, I, policies? Well, I, 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 I agree with certain things that make him mad. I, I don't like the campaign finance laws, and I also think that the inequality gap has widened and will continue to widen uh, unless something is done about it. But I also believe that the most important single thing is to have more golden eggs to distribute around. Uh, so I don't want to do anything to the, to the goose that, that lays the golden eggs. And we've had the goose that lays more and more golden eggs over the years. Unbelievable in this country. So we've got something that works in terms of the market system, in terms of turning out lots of goods and services people want. The question is, what happens to the person who's a decent citizen and doesn't have market skills? And we can solve that. A rich family can handle if they've got six children and one of them isn't as good in the market, it's just as good in every other personal quality. Uh, they take care of them. And we've got $60,000 of GDP per capita in the United States. That's six times what it was when I was born in real terms. So we can take care of people, and we should. But we shouldn't screw up the market system. Well, Bernie looks mild compared to some of the candidates who are running to the left of him. Well, that's because people have seen it, how it worked for him. <laughs> there, there's somebody who wrote in. Uh, this is T13, Ted Waller. Uh, this is probably based off a play off of uh, some conversations we've had with Jamie Dimon. But he says, do you still consider yourself a Democrat? If you look I'm, at, I'm not a card-carrying Democrat, but I never have been. I I've voted for a fair number of Republicans. I've given given money to Republicans. I I am not a. Bob Strauss called me one time because he wanted me to handle finances in Nebraska. He said he let the question. His first question: Warren, are you a card-carrying Democrat? I said no, I'm not, Bob. I, I mean I, I don't think I don't think either side has an edge in virtue or anything of the sort. I mean I think that they have different views on things, and I think that that. By the time they get in politics, they sort of stake out their positions, although they move them in a period like this when they think it may help to be further left. You see people that, that sort of found, had a new, <laughs> new vision all of a sudden because they saw how it worked for Bernie. Uh, but no, I, I will vote for more Democrats than I, if, if, uh, in, 
in the last 30 years, I've voted for more Democrats than I voted for Republicans. I was president of the Young Republican Club in 1948 at the University of Pennsylvania. I ran for delegate to the Republican National Convention in 1960, it's the only office I've ever run for. <laughs> um, when we were just out with, with Charlie Munger, he said he didn't think much of too many politicians, but he did like what Mike Bloomberg did in the city of New York. Um, what do you think about Bloomberg as a potential candidate, and what do you think about Howard Schultz potentially running as a third-party candidate? Well, I, I won't answer you on most questions, but I'll answer you on political. Uh, uh, I would, if, if Mike Bloomberg announced tomorrow that he was a candidate, uh, I would say I'm poor, and uh, I think he would be. I think he'd be a, a very good president. And I mean, he and I disagree on some things, but I think that that. Uh, he knows how to run things. I think that he's got the right goals for America. He understands people. He understands, he understands the market system, and he understands the the problems of people that don't fit well into the market system. I, I, he, he, you know, I, I, I would have no trouble uh, being for him. I, uh, uh, Howard Schultz, uh, uh, if he, well, he, he says he's going to run as an independent, and. If, if he ran as an independent, he, I think he would take votes away from any Democrat, including uh, Bloomberg, if he were running. So I, I think it would be a, a, a real mistake for him to run. And uh, uh, I, I think generally third party candidates, they're going to hurt one side or the other, and they're more likely to hurt the side that they actually favor because they're closer to that view. And so they, they pull more people away that, that, uh, uh, would otherwise, you know, go to the second best with that view. So I, uh, I, I hope no third party candidate runs that pulls any significant amount of votes. I mean, there'll always be a, a couple of people to file, but, but I think third party candidates are, uh, can thwart actually the will of the people. I just want to run through some of the holdings, some of the changes that were registered um, and get your take uh, on, on why. Um, first up, Apple. You trimmed 3 million shares to 249.5 million shares of Apple, and that caught a lot of people by surprise. They were wondering if you were selling. No. Uh, the the one, one other fellow in the office, one of the two, uh, had about 6 or 7 million shares. He had it before I did. Uh, and uh, uh, he works with a limited amount of money, 13 billion roughly. So if he wants to buy something, he needs to sell something. If I want to buy something, I've got cash around to do it. So he sold about three million shares, I believe, uh, cut it in half roughly to buy to buy something else. He, and uh, uh, and I didn't. I, I, I've never sold a share. So th th this was not even a conversation you had with him, I take it? This is it, either Todd or Ted, business. you're not going to say who. It's, it's his business. Yeah, I mean, they do not check with me. Uh, I, I sometimes learn at the end of, well, I do at the end of the month, I, I look and see how their portfolio compares to the month before and see what they've done. This generated a lot of questions from viewers, and let's go to one, T14. Uh, Jedi Marcus wrote in, if you loved it, meaning Apple, undervalued at 200 plus and a trillion dollar valuation, at $200 plus and a trillion dollar valuation, why would you sell any of this past quarter? You've answered it already. You didn't sell yeah, it. Yeah, and incidentally, I've, I've never paid 200 for any stock uh, in Apple. Anyway. Uh, would you start buying at 160 or something? Was that? No, well, I, no, I think our average, 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 average cost is about 141 or something like that. Okay. Uh, there was a question that also came in um, from Rick Safaraz. This is T90. He said, do you plan on adding to your Apple position throughout 2019? And I, I just want to also bring up a tweet from Jim Cramer. He tweeted back on February 5th. Doesn't Apple trade like Berkshire is back buying? I spoke with Kramer about it, and he said, look, I don't know anything. It's just all of a sudden the stock's really picking up. It's almost as if. So mm -hmm. are you interested at lower levels? Uh, I'm always interested at lower levels <clears throat> uh, in, in, in a number of stocks we own. There's some <clears throat> where, where we really can't go over 10%, and generally I don't like to go over 10% because it, it complicates life quite a bit. <clears throat> with banks, it, it actually throws us into the bank holding company act uh, Ground. So there are stocks that I would buy that we own nine and a fraction percent, and I actually may be selling a little bit because they're repurchasing their shares, and I don't want to drift over ten percent. Uh, uh, but uh, Apple, it, it, I don't see myself selling. The, 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 every the lower it goes, the, the better I like it, obviously. 
Uh, I mean, uh, Apple is, is not one of those 10% stocks. Don't you own about 5% of the shares? About 5%. Shares so is this a situation where you have been silent, buying since it came so much lower at the end of December? It's really not back to where it, it may have briefly, very briefly got there, but, uh, but uh, uh, if it were cheaper, we'd be buying it. <laughs> we aren't buying it here. There was another question that came in. This is T91 from Umar Zubair, Zubair, who said, Apple decelerated share purchases, share repurchases, from around $20 billion in the third quarter to around $8 billion in the fourth quarter, just when the stock price went down by about 30%. <clears throat> in fact, Apple repurchased zero shares in December of 2018 when the stock had a 52-week low. What are your thoughts on Apple's repurchase deceleration? Well, and Apple has said publicly that they're, and they've, re, they've repeated it, uh, that their goal is to reach what they call a cash neutral position where their debt <clears throat> is roughly equal to the cash. I think that would take 130 billion or so to get there, but of course they could make some acquisitions. On the other hand, they're earning a lot more than their dividends, so that number goes up. Mentally, I say to myself, we're very likely, uh, I, I, and, and a lot of things could change this with them. Uh, and, and the lower the price goes, the better it gets. But they should be at four billion shares probably in maybe three years. And so our our five percent would become uh, something over six percent at that point. And I, I like that prospect. And then we might buy some ourselves. Who knows? It depends on the price. But they will buy a lot more stock if it's cheaper than if it's at, if it's higher. And and. You know, it's just simple math. We're better off if in the next three years, Apple is cheaper. Uh, you loaded up on financials in the fourth quarter. You added to your stakes in J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Bank of New York, PNC, and U.S. Bank Corp. And six of your top ten holdings, I believe, are banks at this point. Why, why so much emphasis on the financials? They're very good investments at sensible prices, based on my thinking. And they're they're they're. They're cheaper than other businesses that are also good businesses by some margin. And uh, a couple of those, uh, we own nine and a fraction percent of. And I don't like to go to nine, nine, because that means the next quarter, maybe I have to sell some. So I, 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 I try to leave myself a year to two years of repurchases. But uh, Bank of America has been particularly aggressive on, on buying. It's not, and, Brian Moynihan has done such a good job running that company since he took over. I mean, every, he was the most underestimated bank executive in the country. And he is everything he said he would do. He's done it and he's beat it. And he sets tougher targets all the time for himself. And he's been smart about repurchasing shares. Um, J.P. Morgan is a, a relatively new stake. Uh, you had $35 million in the third quarter, and that was a new stake. Uh, you raised it to $50.1 million, million shares, I should say, in the fourth quarter. Is that your purchase? Because yeah. for a long time you held it in your own portfolio. Why I, I've, I've still got a little bit, but that goes back years and years and years. Yeah. So why, why J.P. Morgan now? Well, the better question is why we were so dumb about not buying it <laughs> earlier. <laughs> and, and the answer, I was, I was dumb about buying it earlier. Uh, uh, but it's a it's a very well managed bank and and banks uh, are uh, it, it, you can find a bank like J P Morgan and earns maybe maybe fifteen percent maybe seventeen percent even on net tangible equity a business that earns fifteen or sixteen or seventeen percent on net tangible equity that's incredible in a world of three percent bonds I, I mean just just imagine that you had a deposit account with J.P. Morgan that they made a mistake and they gave you 15% on it and they couldn't redeem it. What would you sell that account for? You wouldn't sell it for 100 cents on the dollar. You wouldn't sell it for 200 cents on the dollar. You wouldn't even sell it for 300 cents on the dollar. You'd have an FDIC guaranteed instrument that would now be at 300 cents on the dollar. If it was 15% on equity, you'd be earning 5% on it, which is way better than treasuries. Now, if on top of that, your deposit allows you to let your interest compound to some extent. Now that instrument becomes even worth way more uh, because if you have an instrument that could compound at 15% for 10 years and use the added capital, that's worth way more than three times tangible equity at, at, at current interest rates, way more. Uh, so, you know, a lot of things can happen to change that equation around and 
the banks, like all other American, almost all other American business, got a, a big plus last year with the new tax bill. I mean, corporations benefited a lot, including Berkshire, including the banks. That can be taken away, you know, so. But on the other hand, the FDIC now has gotten replied. There were special FDIC charges on the big banks. Uh, they ended here recently because the FDIC has $100 billion in it now. Uh, that money has all come from the banks. The U.S. government has not put any money in the FDIC. People think that, you know, that somehow the FDIC uh, is financed by the government. It's guaranteed by the government. Mm -hmm. But the FDIC was started in, I think, January 1st, 1934. And I think one time it borrowed temporarily, but it doesn't have a dime of government money in it. That money, and, and now they've got $100 billion in there, and the banks are much better off because that fund takes care of the bank here and there that goes broke. Incidentally, last year was no, no bank in the United States, no FDIC bank went broke. <laughs> That's the first time in a long time. Let me slip in one more question before we take a break. Um, Oracle, that was a, a stake that you uh, suddenly popped up in the third quarter that Berkshire had $2.1 billion, billion, $2 billion of Oracle shares at the end of the third quarter. It went to zero at the end of the fourth quarter, which it's really unusual to see a technology company creep into the Berkshire holdings like that, and it's even more unusual to see it uh, flushed out so yeah. quickly. Was that you? Uh, yeah, and Larry Ellison's done a fantastic job with Oracle. I mean, uh, I've followed from the standpoint of reading about it, but I felt I didn't understand the business. Then after I started buying it, I felt I still don't understand the business. I, I actually changed my mind in terms of understanding it, not in terms of evaluating it. I think, I mean, Oracle is, is a great business, uh, but I don't think, uh, particularly after my experience with IBM, I, uh, I don't think I understand uh, exactly where the, the cloud is going. Uh, and I, I've been amazed at what Amazon has done there and now Microsoft is doing as well. So I, I just don't know where that, I don't know where that game is going. Uh, that leads us to F4, which is a question from a viewer called, uh, named Mark Hall, who said, with IBM bouncing back, how do you feel about getting out? I'm glad I got out. <laughs> we got out at higher, a lot of higher prices than this. Um, and, and then but but, but I, I, I'm not knocking what they're, you know, but the, the whole market's come back. And the market's at a high. I, uh, it, uh, and that doesn't mean, I, I don't mean it's at a high and then it's going down subsequently. I mean that it's just high, it's higher than it's been on, you know, for, well, really ever. I mean, when we met here 10 years ago, mm -hmm. the, uh, the S&P was at 666 and within a day or two of when we got together and, and you know, people thought America was washed up. Yeah. And, you know, they were afraid of America and what's happened to quadruple in 10 years. How many quadruples do you get in your life? You're a company that has never really shopped around for deals like that. What do you think of companies that do get special deals from states? Well, I've actually helped Nebraska a few times when the governor or somebody's asked me to call a company. Uh, and everybody does. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, it is a competitive game on, on, on locations. But it, it can be a little irritating in a sense when you're already here and you're employing thousands of people and they want to give special incentives to somebody who, uh, and, and which they haven't given you, uh, to be, and, and in some cases to be your competitor. I mean, it, uh, uh, you know, Amazon, Amazon's going to compete plenty in New York regardless, but I mean, Amazon's is going to affect negatively the, the business of many, many, many companies in every state, including New York. That, that is, as Jeff Bezos says, you know, your gross margin is my opportunity. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean you think New York was right to turn down the deal or well, to, to kind of second guess the deal that they had? Yeah, proposed? well, that, that's what happened is they, they, they both got to the altar, you know, and then uh, the dowry was changed in a sense. Uh, I don't know all the details, but and you're, you're in a tough position if you're a company negotiating with public officials because the public officials really can't necessarily be the last say. Whereas at the company, if the CEO says that you got a deal, you got a deal. And on the public side, you know, there's a city council to, that has to ratify a mayor or something of the sort. So it's, it, it's unequal that way. Now, our experience in New York and Buffalo has been fantastic. I mean, Geico went there and we got 3,000 people and the communities helped and, and Governor Cuomo's helped. I mean, just generally, uh, 
it's been very, very, very good for us. But I think if you're going to have a bad marriage, it's better to find out before before they pronounce you man and wife than after. You still, they're both hurt a little bit by the fact that it went there. I mean, it, 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 it makes think people think twice about doing a deal where uh, the community may get upset about you for one way or another, or that the, 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 the politicians can't deliver on it. Uh, and it, from Amazon standpoint, I mean, they, it, it hurts them a little too. Not, not, not a great big way for either one, but it, it's no plus to have things fall apart. So you really, as much as possible, you want to have that sort of thing sealed before. Uh, but you need labor unions, you need political figures. I mean, it, it, a lot of things can tank it on the public side. <laughs> um, you know Jeff Bezos very well. In fact, you're working with he, and, with him and with Jamie Dimon on this health care initiative between the three companies. Can you give us an update on where things stand right now? Well, uh, we've got a terrific fellow in Atul Gandhi uh, running it. It is a long, long-term problem, I mean, a uh, uh, process. and. Uh, and when we get through, we have to not only have uh, a better medical service. I think we've got a lot of great things about our medical system, but it is costing us now 18% of GDP up from 5%. And it is a tapeworm. And if any other cost in America had gone from 5% to 18%, federal taxes have stayed quite constant around 18% for 40 or 50 years. Same time, medical's gone from 5 to 18 Now the, little double counting there because Medicare is in it. But uh, uh, so we've got to stop the cost situation. But what we're hoping to find is something that will not only do a better job for our em employees, but have them feel better about it and stop the ascending rate. Uh, you know, every point you chew up of GDP comes comes out of some comes from somebody else. I mean, it, uh, uh, there are only 100 cents in the dollar, uh, but it's a very long term. I mean, it, 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 it's it, and 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 we'll get something done. The probabilities, you know, I mean, it, we are a, we are trying to change a 3.3 billion dollar industry, 3.3 trillion dollar industry. I'm sorry, that really for the people participating, and they feel pretty good about it. I mean, the. The people getting the 3.4 trillion. The, ho the hospitals aren't unhappy. The PBMs aren't unhappy. The drug man. I mean, they, you know, they may complain a little bit, but the people that are getting the 3.4 trillion are not screaming change, change, change. Right. What are your thoughts on Kraft Heinz following all the current news, and what is your biggest concern regarding Kraft Heinz' future? Well, we have some very, very strong brands at Kraft Heinz, and as I pointed out earlier, the company earns about six billion dollars pre-tax but after depreciation uh, not after amortization but after depreciation earn six billion on seven billion of tangible assets it's a fabulous business it's, it's in terms of return on tangible assets i mean this is a great business we're sitting here at the furniture mart but it returns much higher at, at crap it's much higher than it is at jp morgan it's, it's much it, you, you go up and down the list there's very few companies that are earning six billion on seven billion of tangible assets but we paid a hundred billion more than the tangible assets in buying, and and we overpaid in 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 craft. Uh, I don't think we overpaid in Heinz, and uh, we borrowed money that related to projections that that uh, uh, have not been met. We earned a lot of money, but we were paying out a lot of money, so we had very little in the way of retained earnings to reduce debt. So uh, our debt of 31 billion is higher than we projected originally to rating agencies and so on. And, and uh, we need to bring it down. And uh, it comes down very slowly. I mean, uh, unless you sell, sell properties. I mean, even if you cut the dividend from 250 to, to 160, that's a billion one a year. But on 31 billion, it's, it, you'll go the right direction. But there's a lot of, there's, there's, there's real debt to be reduced. Uh, a lot of people wrote in and had questions about your partnership with 3G. 3G were your partners in the Heinz deal and then with the addition of Kraft as well. Uh, let's go to T61. This is from James Shanahan. Mr. Buffett, how would you characterize the relationship with 3G today? Would you still consider additional deals with 3G? Yeah, I considered Georgie Paulo and, and his associates, but my primary contact's been with Georgie Paulo Lemon. Uh, over the years, first meeting him on the Gillette board, and I think he's an 
absolutely outstanding human being. And and uh, uh, and it, but a year ago, he, he pointed out that the game had changed in terms of brands. That in, he gave a talk at some Forbes event or someplace, and and uh, that that was a full year ago. And six months ago, I told you on, on you know at the Glide thing that uh, brands said. Uh, it's, it's not as, packaged goods are not as good a business as they were. The really strong brands are, but, uh, uh, you know, we've learned that over the last few years as the struggle between the retailers and the, and the brands has shifted toward uh, the retailers. And that's why Kirkland is a big, a very, very big brand. Walmart's going more to, to uh, 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 private label. Uh, uh, there's some big forces on the other side. If you've got if you've got a good enough brand, you you can you can uh, you can also call your term. Costco dropped Coca-Cola some years ago. Uh, they brought them back. <laughs> do you see that ever shifting, or do you think that the the game is going to be this way, weighted towards the retailers, well, except for the biggest brands? It certainly looks like, particularly with the addition of Amazon to the picture. I mean, when you when you have Amazon and Walmart fighting. It's a little bit like the elephants fighting. You know, I mean, the mice get trampled. <laughs> and uh, 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 I don't see, I certainly don't see the retailer's position getting weaker. I mean, you have Aldi coming in and stronger. I, it, it just, and you got, uh, Walmart's done a very, very, very good job. You had Doug McMillan on, and, and it, but he carries around that list of, the ten top retailers from the past, and from every decade, to remind, yeah, to remind him, you know, that it, it's hard to stay on top, and and and, uh, but now you've got two very and a lot of other players too, but two particularly strong players that that uh, have got their foot to the floor, and uh, and to some extent are will be pushing their own brands. In terms of the partnership with 3G. Um, if the situation has changed, according to both Georgie Lehman, Georgie Paolo Lehman, and to you, if brands are not as strong as they used to be, and as you've said in the past, it's gotten really much more expensive to try and look at any of these other consumer packaged goods companies and potentially buy them. Does that mean the whole 3G formula has kind of been upended? Is it really difficult to make it work if you can't go out and buy another company and then cut costs? Yeah, well, the acquisition just don't work as well. I mean, for one thing, the prices got pushed up and uh, you know, anything, almost, almost anything at a price can be good. Not everything, but anything at a, at a certain price can be bad. I mean, if you if you pay too much, you pay too much, and and uh, and it doesn't that doesn't change. And if you borrowed a fair amount in conjunction with it, it takes a while to uh, uh, turn it around. I, I I do not see. Well, we're not in a position. Uh, to, to buy additional brands, and I, I, I have not thought it made sense uh, as we've seen both prices change and the competitive position change somewhat. I still like the, I, I like the businesses we have. Uh, very much I'll be happy to be in Kraft Heinz five years from now or ten years from now. I'm certainly happy to be Georgie Apollo's partner. He's a terrific human being uh, and, uh, and very smart on business, but, but you can say that we both uh, misjudged the retail versus uh, brand fight as to uh, who would be gaining ground on the other. Watching what happened to shares of Kraft Heinz on, on Friday, after all that news came out, after the market closed on Thursday, I mean, stock was down 30 percent, and I think for Berkshire alone, that was a loss of about $4 billion. On top of your $3 billion share of the $15 billion write-down, um, I know you wrote in the annual meeting or in the annual letter about how there are days because you have such a big portfolio, $173 billion in stocks, there are days with market volatility being back that you see a swing of plus or minus $4 billion on certain right. days. I know you're like Dr. Spock. You're completely emotionless when it comes to dealing with market moves. But is there any part of you that gets a little queasy when you see that you've lost $4 billion in a day? Not in the least. <laughs> no, I mean, it makes me, uh, assuming I like the business, depends which ones they are, but overwhelmingly, uh, during the fourth quarter, the things were going down. A, they were buying out their own stock. So I'm actually making money that day, you know, without laying out a dime. Uh, and then secondly, I can buy more of some, although a lot of them I've got that 10% uh, problem with. But I, uh, I mean, there are certain stocks I would have 
kept buying, except I was bumping up against uh, the, the 10%. Uh, but no, I, uh, I mean, if, if, if you paid X, X dollars a pound for a hamburger yesterday and you go in today and now it's at, at, at 80% of X, Maybe you have a little hamburger left in your refrigerator or something. Do you tear your hair out over the, that? Or do you say, my God, you know, this is terrific. The price is cheaper. What, what else in the world don't you like to buy cheaper than, than you're paying the day before? Uh, that's a fair if you're point. Gonna, if you're going to keep buying it. That's the very logical way of looking at things, the yeah. rational way. Hey, Joe has a question, too. Uh, Joe? M Mr. Spock. Mr. Dr. Spock is that wacky guy uh, Dr. That, Spock. That, that wouldn't console Oh, right, he's the baby guy. That, that said, let the kids cry all <laughs> I finally day. said something that got your attention. No. <laughs> no, I actually wanted to ask about <laughs> I wanted to ask. That, I, I was just talking about Dr. Spock with my son. He was, I don't know. He was, I don't know if you would just let kids cry forever. I think you need to. Anyway. Um, no. No, no way. No, you can't. You can't. That guy was wacko. I'm trying no. to explain Freud, too. Another one. Uh, <laughs> I agree. Uh, Anyway, Good luck so with that. Can I ask uh, quickly about that 60 Minutes and just some, some philosophical questions, yeah, Warren? Yeah. So the basic thrust yeah. of this piece yesterday on electric cars was that, um, at least the way I read it is, in this country, I think we're starting to, to feel like maybe the subsidies that Tesla gets aren't really a good way to do things necessarily. And, and over in China, they seem to be going the other way where they are going to subsidize this. It's almost a state-run enterprise how much they're subsidizing electrical vehicles. As a result, the thrust of the piece was by 2025, they're going to be doing a couple of million, three, four million electric vehicles. We're going to be stuck down under a half million. It, I, is that what we should be doing here in your view? Or, or is there a reason you're invested over there in electric vehicles? rather than here. I mean, is that the way to do it? Should we be subsidizing it completely here in the U.S. or, or do market forces uh, uh, allocate capital better? Markets are better generally, Joe. I mean, you know me on that. Uh, but that doesn't mean all the time. There's certain, uh, but markets are better. I think, I actually think electric cars, I, I think you're going to have a lot of people pushing electric cars in, in the United States, even though the subsidy is going away. I think it goes away at 200,000 units or something like that, and, and Tesla's hitting it and so on. But uh, no, I think electric cars are, are very much in America's future, and uh, I think much sooner than autonomous driving. Uh, uh, but I, I, listen, I'm all for the Chinese doing what they're doing. I mean, it, it, in, 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 terms of the, in terms of the planet, you know, it's 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 a good thing. So I, I I cheer them for doing it. I don't think we'll need to do it in the United States that much. But you're think, invested yeah. over there. You're not I'm, invested I'm in here, right? Oh, we we bought the BYD ten years ago, and okay. Charlie called me up and said, "Buy this." And <laughs> this, that is totally Charlie's position, and and it's done fine. And and he keeps in touch with the management and all that. I that is not something that that. Uh, I, I could not tell you within 20% what the price of BYD is. I, I don't look at okay, it. Okay, so that's not your thing. Okay, but I just, just watching at it, you know, the, the, the spin I was getting from 60 Minutes was that, you know, we're, we don't understand that, you, you know, certain industries you need full-on government uh, assistance or, or almost, uh, you know, subsidies out the, you know, the 10 times what they are right now to try and win at something, which is not surprising for 60 minutes, but I was just wondering whether you thought we're going to fall behind if we don't have a concerted government effort to, to prop up the industry. I think there's a pretty concerted industry effort from what I hear. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, uh, no, I think you're going to see a lot more electric. And incidentally, I mean, you know, we have an interest in, in pilot flying J, and, and, and so we have, we have certain businesses that, that uh, uh, would be adversely affected uh, with all electric, but I, I, I think we're going in that direction, and I think you'll see uh, the American companies quite aggressive in that field. All right, I was listening the whole time, Becky. What do you mean that's the only time I'm? I was listening. I'm li been listening. I got nothing else to do here but listen. So uh, I believe I was. I was listening. I just. <laughs> I just like that. I like that. You know, you know how much I love mixed metaphors. My favorite is like uh, it's a walk in the go. cake, like uh, you know, or or you know, there's just so many good yes. ones if you can mix them up. But when yeah. they start working on March, 
March, March start, Madden. Joe, start working on your March Madness ballot. I, I know I won't. You know, I, I, We're I know how you operate, Buffett. I, I, I mean, yeah. I, you, why don't you just <laughs> offer why, offer a hundred billion to someone who gets a perfect bracket? <laughs> it's never going to happen. It's never going to use the. It's never going to happen. Ever. No, no. It has happened once, didn't it? Didn't well, we, a kid won a few years ago with we, a perfect bracket? Uh, not, not against All you, you have to do is get through the first bracket to win a million dollars, assuming nobody else wins That's at hard, the same dude. time. You, then you split so the million. Hard, right. It's a great thing. I can't had, wait. But yeah. we had five of them. Two years ago, we had five of them that got to the last four games. And, and perfect. That's amazing. And four of them went out on one game and one went out on the other game. But they split it. What are your thoughts just in terms of looking around trying to find businesses, trying to find pieces of business versus when you started the game? Well, it's harder for two reasons, one of which is peculiar to us is we just, we've got a lot more money. So our universe of possible things to do has shrunk from thousands and thousands of things that I used to look at when I had small amounts of money to a relatively few things now. See, that, that, that seems to defy logic. I have more money, so I have fewer things I can do. But it's just because a deal, it, it's it going to be much bigger than the needle. needle. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, no, I, there's probably 100 stocks. You know, if we put $5 billion in something and it's 10% of the market cap, which would be as much as it would be. You're talking 50 billion and up market caps, uh, and and five billion is one percent of our of Berkshire's value. So if it goes up 50 percent, we make a half a percent, you know, basically on on, on value before tax, 35, 40 basis points afterwards. I'd love to <laughs> so, have your problems. Yeah. So <laughs> and and then the second thing is, I mean, obviously got way more competition than when we started uh, uh, the 19. Well, really, when I took Ben Graham's class in 1951, I mean, uh, the whole world was was uh, my oyster because people were not going through the manuals, and you had to. It's easier to get the data now, for one thing. I mean, just with the internet, far easier. And I used to mail away for annual reports and go to the Interstate Commerce Commission, the Public Utility Commission, the Insurance Commission. I went to all those offices and dug through papers, and and now it's. You know, it takes five, five seconds for somebody to get the same information. I'll, I'll ask this very fleetingly. Have you, has your position changed on Bitcoin? Uh, no, I mean, it's too bad, but, but Bitcoin, it, it's ingenious, and blockchain is important, but Bitcoin has no unique value at all. It doesn't produce anything. You can stare at it all day, and no little Bitcoins come out or anything like that. It's, it's, it is a, it's, it's a, it's a delusion, basically. <laughs> So we've gone from rat poison squared to a delusion. Well, it's kind of think, an upgrade. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I know. Who knows where we'll be next year? But I, I, I'm, I'm really sorry it happens because people get their hopes up that something like that is going to change their lives. And it was a very ingenious thing to figure out how to have a limited supply and make it harder to, more expensive to create them as you go along and all that sort of thing. But it doesn't. The function. As, and, and this is explained to me by people a lot smarter than I am, but they say blockchain does not depend. On, you know, and JP Morgan is talking about creating their own, you know, JPM, and, and it'll, it'll be worth a dollar. I mean, it's matched to the dollar to dollar, and uh, it's, I, 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 I'm, I'm sympathetic to people that own it. There, there are a lot of questions that are kind of like the new Bitcoin questions. We got several questions that came in to ask you about. I'll, I'll go to T46. This is Forca Design LLC. Do you think the hemp and marijuana industry is a viable industry to invest in, even though there are still restraints on how capital can be moved and used? We got lots of variations yeah, on this I, question. It, it's an industry that I don't know really anything about usage or otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> never? No, never. No, I, I couldn't figure out how to do it. I, I, mean, I, I couldn't even smoke a cigarette. I mean, I, <laughs> I, you were talking to a guy that doesn't pick up things very fast. <laughs> what do you think about college athletes and whether they should be paid? And I ask you this, having watched what happened with, with Zion Williamson, the Duke player whose Nike shoe blew up on him last week, it kind of reignited that whole debate. And you're a longtime watcher of college athletics. Well, I, I, I'll say this. If I was an athlete, I think I probably should. I, I would probably have a view on it. I should be. I mean, that, that you are... A, I mean, if you're really good, you're of enormous commercial value, and 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 the rules of design are designed to prevent you from cashing in on that commercial value. You know, the, for some period, it doesn't. Uh, so, I, I 
the rich schools are going to win then. <laughs> That's, Harvard may have a resurgence of football. <laughs> um, this one came in T28. Uh, Mitsutaka Goto said, do you see any irrational human behavior by investors or corporate Americans right now? Uh, you're, you're kind of, you and Charlie are kind of like the, the police of corporate America. Mm -hmm. What do you see that you don't like right now? Well, there's always a certain number of people doing things that, uh, that are designed to take advantage of other people. I mean, the market is so big, and uh, so there's always been people that, you know, Maybe it's Bitcoin. Maybe it's new issues. I mean, look at all the look at look at all the things that have been created around Bitcoin. I mean, and there, there's been a lot of fraud and disappearance and all these kind of things. It it attracts charlatans basically because the money's so big. I mean, if you go out and do something phony and selling yo-yos or something, there's no real money in it. But when you get into Wall Street, there's huge money, and and you can do it with little pieces of paper, and they don't bounce back on you for a long time. And a lot of people get. Well, Madoff was the ultimate example, but uh, uh, but that's 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 going to happen, and that's why we've got an SEC and why we have got courts. And, and uh, uh, but it'll always continue. It'll always need policing. There are a bunch of new technology IPOs that are slated to come <clears throat> to to market this year. I think back to what you thought about the tech IPOs back in 1999 and not wanting to be near them. These are a little different. A lot of these actually have earnings. Uh, you think of an Airbnb. You think of a uh, Pinterest or something along these lines. Is this different? What do you, how yeah, do you value them, this stuff? No, yeah, but the big ones have losses and, and, Uber. and, and, and some of them report earnings differently than I would report earnings. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, we don't, we haven't bought IPOs and, and if you think about it, you've got a whole bunch of people on the other side who have an interest in marking up each stage of it, even if it's phony. Sometimes they offer one price for the, the employees that already have the shares, and then but then they have an artificial price that so they can say that this round went at a higher price. Uh, it's they're picking the time to sell to you. I don't like. I like it when I'm picking the time to buy in a 2008 rather than having them pick the time when they've decided this is the time we can cash in by selling to you. We're going to do you a big favor and let you buy in. So I have never been a big fan of of IPOs, and I'm. And the valuations are kind of staggering now on some. Any in particular? No, not that I, no. Nothing you feel like discussing. <laughs> By category. <laughs> but, but let's, the category of those that you think the valuation is staggering is based on what? Just earnings per the market just, for some uh, days? I mean, if, if a company's going to come public, we'll pick a figure, $50 billion. Okay. What should you expect it to earn in five years? Is it? You should certainly expect it to be earning five billion pre-tax. I mean, if you wait five years to get ten percent on your money, uh, and people they don't sell them that way. You know, it, uh, there aren't that many companies that earn five billion or more pre-tax. There's a fair number, but 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 it's not that easy, and it's particularly not that easy if you count what you're paying the employees and stock options and all that sort of thing. A uh, question came in. This is T112 from Todd Marshall. He says, who wins more at the card, uh, the card game bridge, Buffett or Gates? Who, who well, wins more I, when you I, play bridge? I probably play 100 times as often as Bill. So that, that's probably the only game in the world where I'd have a slight edge with him. <laughs> 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 a very slight edge. And if he, if he probably spent two solid days working on uh, he'd do better. I, oh, I, while, I, while you bring up Bill Gates, Melinda B Gates has got a book coming out on April 23rd. I think it's one of the best books I've ever read. What's it about? It's about women, and it's about women around the world. It's about herself, and it's very candidly told, and the stories are terrific. And I, I read it the other day at one sitting. It's, it's only 220 or 30 pages. It's coming out April 23rd, and I, I think it'll be a huge seller. That's great. We'll look forward to seeing it. Another question that came in is T55. Steve Pilgrim asks, for those of us who have lived our lives and careers reading and listening to Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, to whom do they recommend our grandchildren listen? Well, I hope it's to us, <laughs> but that, that would be sort of an actuarial freak. Uh, uh, no, there's plenty of interesting uh, uh, writers that, I, you know, I, I, but I, I will tell you, this, the fundamentals won't change. You're not going to discover anything new about investments in the next 50 or 100 years. I mean, the, uh, it's buying a business. You have to know how to value the business and you have to know something about how markets operate. You don't buy a business unless you can value it. 
you have to learn how to value businesses and know the ones that are within your circle of competence and the ones that are outside. And that won't change. And it really gets back to laying, investing is laying out a dollar an hour, per, dollar purchasing power, and getting more back in the future. And you try and figure out, you know, how much you're willing to pay for that bird in the bush compared to the bird in the hand. Warren, we want to thank you for the three hours that you've spent with us today. We, we truly appreciate your time. Thank you.